So uh, we're going to transition over into some of our larger conversations with which Christian just kind of teed up for us. Uh, what happens when we have uh, estuaries and ecosystems that create precipitation? So we're going to introduce uh, the Desert Research Institute first. Uh, sorry uh, for going long. Uh, we'll, we'll continue and we'll expand this over time if we need to push our other events back. Uh, we're going to um, turn this over to uh, Dr. David Mitchell. Are you there, um, Dr. Mitchell? Let me pin you up here. How are we doing today? Yeah, I'm here. Um, so <clears throat> thank you for inviting me. This is a really amazing uh, series of presentations and talks um, that I, I totally um, agree with what Christian was saying about being a model for so many other places around the world that applying human intelligence to um, in this direction, I mean, it's got a bad rap in the past, putting human intelligence to make a lot of money and exploiting the environment, but that tide could be reversed. And I think that's what's the beginning of what's happening here, is just reversing that tide. And so congratulations for being at the cutting edge of all this. Thank you. No, we're, we're doing the uh, Coachella of science, right? <laughs> we're doing the entertainment of high technology and ways that we can start to reverse climate change, right? That's our, that's our mission here um, as a collective project management team. And thank you for being a part of that, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mitchell. Um, yeah, let's get started. Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, team, the Desert Research Institute. Okay, <clears throat> so I'll uh, share the screen here. So this is um, sort of a summary of about uh, 15 years of research on the North American monsoon, maybe more than that, 20 years. Maybe. Um, so <clears throat> what I'll try to do here is um, relate this to some of the thoughts on the Salton Sea. <clears throat> but um, Mostly, this is going to be about uh, understanding the North American monsoon, how it works, and then by knowing that, you can relate that to uh, how adding more seawater in the region would possibly uh, relate to the monsoon. So, um, what we've done is we've uh, used satellite Hold on a second, I'm gonna shut the door here. We've been uh, using satellite data and modeling, weather model models, uh, to study the relationship between sea surface temperatures in the Sea of Cortez and rainfall amounts in the monsoon region. And the slides that follow are going to show you what these relationships are. So we'll start off with observations <clears throat> and then show how we can actually reproduce those observations more or less in the climate, uh, regional climate model that we're using called the WARF model. Uh, and then um, we can utilize our regional scale model to provide scientifically um, sound information on the monsoon sensitivity to the, if you want to add more water to the region like Laguna Salada, uh, what would the model predict? We haven't done that yet, <clears throat> but um, that's the intention behind uh, my conversations with Rob Simpson um, and, and uh, Gabby Schubert of the California Water Tech. Um, so we're proposing a, a, a study, if we have the option or opportunity, um, to simulate different sizes of Laguna Salada and the Salt. Well, the Salton Sea would probably be about the same size. Um, and you could increase it with Laguna Salada and predict the effects of um, changing these water bodies in size. So <clears throat> what would happen if you decrease their size and increased. And increasing um, the size of Laguna Salada would likely increase the humidity and rainfall in the region. Um, but whether it 
that alone could benefit the drying up of the salt and sea is unknown. So I'll talk about that at the very end. But um, just for overview, this is a satellite picture uh, taken of the North American monsoon. And you can see the Sea of Cortez, Gulf uh, Baja, California, and so on. <clears throat> the Sea of Cortez receives warm water from a, a current that moves up the coast of Mexico called the Mexican Current. And that's been recently documented by the group at Sasese um, with drifters, and they show um, this current anyway. And it basically uh, explains the rapid increase in sea surface temperature <clears throat> that you get, that you observe there. It goes, it can increase by two degrees in a few days. So that's a huge increase in energy. The only way to explain that is a warm current moving poleward up the Gulf there. But anyway, the uh, Northwest Mexico receives most of its pre annual precipitation from that 60 to 80%. Arizona, 35%, New Mexico, 45%, Southern Nevada, around 25, and Southern, Southeastern California, about the same. So it's obviously an important water source. Um, the, the monsoon, in terms of cloud cover, you can see it moving all the way up into Canada. So it, really uh, affects a huge amount of land mass that people are generally unaware of. You, most people think of it in terms of Arizona and New Mexico, and it's, they get the lion's share of it in the United States, but it also affects every, you know, regions further north, even Washington State and Oregon sometimes. So our research started off um, in a paper in 2002 in Journal of Climate, it shows uh, on this first figure on the left, the normalized cumulative rainfall. And this was kind of a big surprise when we looked at it, that you can think of time on the x-axis going from, in terms of sea surface temperatures. So that warm current I mentioned is, this is in the Northern Gulf of California. <clears throat> so we're systematically increasing the temperature over time in the northern gulf as that warm current comes in. And around the middle of July, it reaches a temperature of about 29 and a half degrees typically. And that's where you see this inflection point. So the monsoon actually starts, this is for the Arizona, New Mexico region between June and August, through August. And you get some um, sniffles of precipitation, some light rain before that, but it really kicks in at 29 and a half degrees. And that's what this analysis suggests anyway, but we still need a mechanism to explain that. Uh, on the right side, it shows the regional rainfall rate. And again, at 29 and a half, the yellow bars are the higher rainfall rates that it, are associated with these warmer sea surface temperatures. So as the Gulf, the Northern Gulf warms up, you get a certain threshold where it really triggers the rainfall. So the question might be, um, how does Laguna Salada fit into that? Well, it would be warmer than 29 and a half degrees. So it would have no problem having a good communication with the atmosphere to export that moisture into the middle and atmosphere and get convection going. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is for the 2012 monsoon, the onset. <clears throat> and the um, northern Gulf sea surface temperatures are on the left side here, the left axis, and the rainfall rates are on the right axis in millimeters per day. And then time is on your x-axis here. And this is what uh, if you take the overall sea surface area of the northern Gulf and get an average value, these dots represent the average sea surface temperature of the northern Gulf. And right at 29 and a half degrees is this dashed line. And you can see the threshold is crossed around the beginning of July. And shortly after that, there's typically a time lag of a week or so. <clears throat> um, 
for that. Sometimes it's only a few days though. In this case, it's probably a few days. Um, and it's often, that's probably more often the case is about two to three days time lag. And you get a um, increase, a big increase in the rainfall rate. So before that, you get a little bit of sniffles going on, but the big rainfall begins after that threshold is crossed. Doesn't happen every year, but, uh, and we don't know exactly what the percentage of time it, it obeys this behavior is, but probably around half the time or more would be my guess. Um, anyway, as it goes down, the rainfall goes down and then it comes back up again and the rainfall goes up again. So that's the pattern that we see in some of the years we've looked at. This is another um, satellite analysis of that. Um, 2012 looks just like this. This is for a different year, 2002, but they both behave the same way. Um, the upper left panel shows the um, Gulf of California sea surface temperature, and the legend is showing the temperatures that the dark orange is, is the threshold temperature more. Um, so the two shades of orange is the, where you're above the threshold. And the, this is uh, on July 7th. And then you move two days later to July 9th and you've increased your temperature in the Northern Gulf by about two degrees, 2.4 degrees. And this uh, overall average temperature on the lower panel is 29.8 Celsius. So you're now able to break what happens to be an inversion layer. So as I'll show in a moment, there's an inversion layer over the Gulf of California. And when you exceed this threshold of 29 and a half, roughly, you, you basically erode that aversion, inversion layer by creating a, a temperature profile without an inversion that allows convection to occur. So this first panel is on the 7th of July, and it's show it's looking at the total precipitable water. So those purples are very dry conditions, or even drier if it's gray. Then it's kind of intermediate when it's yellow and green. And then when you see the reds, that's the high water vapor. So most of the water vapor in the atmosphere is in low levels of the atmosphere. You don't have high levels of water vapor up high. It's, it's generally close to the surface, relatively close. So you can interpret this as water vapor right over the Gulf, uh, close to the surface. So when you go to July 9th, you see a lot more red coming into the Gulf. This could be a Gulf surge event where it's, um, but it's uh, also uh, could be associated with a change in sea surface temperature, which is the case here. And then on the 11th, there's a lot more red. The white is a cloud, convect, um, thunderstorms. So where you see these white spots are thunderstorms popping up. And that indicates it's raining probably underneath those clouds on the 11th of July. So also on the 9th of July, you have some convection in Arizona on the east side. So if you want to look at the rainfall from satellite, this is what you see on the 11th. There's plenty of rain occurring over Arizona as a result of uh, what what we would argue is the uh, inversion layer breaking. And then a few days later on the 15th, you've got that rainfall moving up northwards into Canada even. So when you put all this together, it gives you kind of a mechanistic uh, understanding of how this monsoon system is working. So it, you can think of it as triggered by the sea surface temperatures initially. So what we have here is a map that shows um, isotherms of 27 and a half degree water moving up the coast of Mexico. We found that convection is typically activated at that temperature of 27 and a half degrees um, down below, you know, below uh, the Gulf of California. So um, you can just see the dates as you move 
uh, in time, <clears throat> the warm water is encroaching further and further northwards. And these yellow um, bands here are from what's called outgoing long wave radiation, but it's a measure of convection. So by knowing the radiative flux, which is minimized by convection at the top of a thunderstorm, it's very cold. So you get very little of the long wave radiation due to the thunderstorms. And so it gives you a measure of the um, leading edge of the monsoon where the convection's occurring. So it's basically shown here is the northern boundary of the monsoon. So as the sea surface, uh, I mean the ocean water, as it's warm, that really warm water comes north, it advances the convection shown in yellow. And the convection seems to be more or less in step in, you know, in synchronicity with the advance of poleward moving seawater, warm water. And the convection is, is creating high pressure uh, over the Sierra Madre Mountains. So this um, convection over the Sierra Madres is producing the, the center of high pressure shown by the blue circles. And the, the reason that's important is because this is rotating in a, a clockwise pattern, the anticyclonic pattern, and that's pulling in moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean to uh, moisten up the monsoon at mid-levels. So the Gulf of California is supplying moisture at low levels, and these, uh, the evolution of the high-pressure cell is pulling in mid-level moisture. So together, it gives you a juicy monsoon. And you can see in the red circles up here, Laguna Salada. So on July 13th, on a climatological basis, uh, Laguna Salada would typically get a little bit of monsoon rainfall, and the Salton Sea is just a little bit north of that. And then here is the, um, just for one year, just for fun, we looked at the Las Vegas flood, and this is one of the floods. Las Vegas gets flooded fairly, not often, but it, you know, maybe once every five years or so. Um, and this is uh, what it looked like in the northern Gulf of California in red. Uh, the time is on the x-axis and sea surface temperature in the northern Gulf is, and the southern Gulf. So the green is the southern Gulf sea surface temperature. I mean the central Gulf and northern Gulf in red. So just before the flood, there was a big surge in the northern Gulf sea surface temperature by about one and a half degrees, which is a lot of energy. And right after that, there was a flood because you have to have the right wind conditions. But if you do have the right wind flow, uh, which I think did occur on this uh, situation, this onset, um, that's what happens. So there's a new paper that's um, I reviewed for um, Journal of um, um, Geo <clears throat> JGR, Geophysical Research Atmospheres, and it's coming out soon. So it's been accepted for publication. So I figured it's okay to show this, but it's, uh, they were looking at the same relationship that I've been discussing and how the um, boundary layer height over the Gulf of California affects the rainfall. And <clears throat> what's shown on the left side panel is for the first 15 days after the monsoon onset and the right hand side is 30 days after monsoon onset and so what they're doing is they're relating the height of this marine boundary layer to the um, amount of rainfall in the monsoon region over the Sierra Madres and the, the dotted or speckled areas is the 95 percent confidence level so this is a climatological result. It's over uh, 1982 to 2018. So it's, you know, many years of data. And it's the correlation between the two, between the height of the boundary layer, which tends to be high when you have warmer water. So when the ocean water is warmer, the boundary layer is higher or it disappears even because um, the inversion is broken. 
And so either you have a high boundary layer or, or no boundary layer. And when you string that, when, when you look at the data for a longer period of time, the correlation increases so that you're including uh, the Colorado basin. So this area on the right is, is kind of telling you the region that the Salton Sea and Laguna Salada would possibly affect. But whether that would happen, we don't know. Um, let's see, how am I doing on time? Better. So this is the modeling that we did. And we just looked at this region and the, we focused on this white square. And this is um, using a, a predecessor of the uh, weather regional forecast model called WARF. So what we were um, hoping to use in a future study is called the WARF model. This study was done with the MM5 model, which was the predecessor. So it's very similar, in other words, to the WARF model. And these are what the sea surface temperatures look like in terms of degrees latitude. Like if you look at the axis of the Gulf of California, um, you're going north to south more or less. So the northern Gulf is on the right and below the Gulf of California is on the left side and the southern and central Gulf are in the middle. And what, what happens over time is, is shown by the series of, of, of curves here. So at the bottom, we're at the beginning. Uh, so on, around the beginning of June, the northern Gulf is much co colder than the rest of the Gulf. And then as you go, uh, that it stays that way through June. And only until you get to mid-July do you start balancing out the northern Gulf with the rest of the Gulf. So after the middle of July, you have similar, the northern Gulf is similar in temperature. And that's what we did in our model is, you know, we, we took these temperatures into consideration and um, gave different simulations for different periods of time. Basically, it looked at, we looked at um, three simulations the most, which are, um, but what the general idea is, is that we want to see if the model predicts our expectations based on this conceptual model, like the observations are supporting, that when the sea surface temperature over the Gulf is less than 30 degrees about, um, you have an inversion. And that's trapping the moisture in the marine boundary layer. But if you increase the temperature by, you know, a degree up to 30, you basically erode that inversion, you get rid of it. So that allows a free transfer of moisture into the free troposphere. And you can, the amount of energy produced by that is enormous because your uh, level of free convection is way up here. Um, before the inversion is broken. But when you break the inversion, your level of free convection and your liquid condensation level is much lower now. So you start generating CAPE at a much lower level. CAPE means uh, convective available potential energy. So that's the energy that's produced in a thunderstorm. So it, it changes the convection around the region dramatically by increasing the sea surface temperature one degree in this case. So does that really, what does the model say? Um, so this is that what the model is showing for uh, the Northern Gulf is at 26 degrees and below the Northern Gulf, it's at 28 degrees. It's generating a little bit of CAPE, convective available potential energy, but not a whole lot. It's much more active down south of there where the water is warmer. And then if we increase the temperature in the Northern Gulf to 29 degrees and 30 below the Northern Gulf, you get a little more uh, cape in the Northern Gulf, like you'd expect maybe. If you increase it past that threshold of 29 and a half degrees, you get this result, which is a huge difference. The donut looking thing in the middle is because we, we went off scale, basically. We don't, the, the legend we're using on the right side for the cape, uh, we just exceeded the maximum value there. That's why there's a hollow spot. So it, bottom line is that we 
produce, the model produces a huge amount of convective available potential energy once you cross that threshold. And then um, if we look at another thing called SIN, which is convective inhibition, it's like the energy that resists convection. And it has to do with the inversion, like whether or not there's an inversion. That is um, shown in the early morning hours for these three different simulations here that assume different sea surface temperatures in the, in the Gulf. Uh, again, the um, Northern Gulf is on the left side of the dash of the um, ratio. So basically in the afternoon at 72 hours here, you can see how the, um, for the colder ocean water, you have that sin over the whole Gulf of California. Basically it tells you there's an inversion there. So where, wherever you see that orange, that, that tongue of orange over the Gulf, that's telling you there's an inversion. So. You, even at 29 degrees, there's a pretty prominent inversion. But then the model at 30 degrees, there's no more inversion over most of the Gulf of California. So the model basically agrees with our expectations and the observations. In terms of rainfall, the 29 degree Northern Gulf of California simulation, it, it does give some rainfall. It gives up to about six millimeters in the yellow here over a, um, a one or two day period. And on the 30 degrees um, gives uh, a lot more, obviously, a lot more, um, like the orange is over six millimeters a day and, and so on. So it's basically showing there's a big uh, abrupt change. So if we wanna look at that in terms of the normalized rainfall rate versus the sea surface temperature, that I showed earlier over the Northern Gulf of California, the, the data shown earlier is in the histograms and the circles are predicted by the model. Like you take the maximum amount of rainfall predicted by the model and um, as the denominator. So it's a ratio of um, each one of these circles is a separate simulation for that case study at the onset on that uh, 1999 onset. And so we're using the model results for the onset of 1999 monsoon in the northern Gulf. And we divide each simulation value at a given temperature by the maximum, which is at 32 degrees. So that's how we get this normalized rainfall rate. And we normalize the observations as well. Um, and anyway, there's pretty good agreement between the observations and the model. And this is for the Arizona, New Mexico region. So we felt um, pretty encouraged by these results, like we have something here. So to wrap up the um, talk, this is the last slide, basically, that um, what our ideas are for the future, if we could uh, model the um, increase in, in uh, surface water, uh, Laguna Salada and the Salton Sea, what would the contribution be to con um, convection in the region? So here's our convection over here on the left. <clears throat> so we don't know at all um, whether that would make a difference because this might be too small a body of water to make a difference. But there seems to be some interest in finding out, so we're happy to do that. And with the addition of mangrove trees or you know more vegetation, more agriculture, that'll produce additional evaporation, evapotranspiration. And the, the surface of the water itself will contribute. It'll also cool the temperature down a little bit over the region just north of the northern of the Sea of Cortez. So that change in the temperature between the Sea of Cortez and the land, if you decrease that temperature gradient, you get a decreased monsoonal flow of air. So there's sort of a trade-off between, you know, the, the gradient effect and the evaporation effect of the water. So which one is going to win out, we don't really know. So we need a model to tell us which one gets the um, prevailing influence. 
So to summarize, you know, we think that there's this threshold of 29 and a half degrees for the Gulf and that the uh, mechanism appears to be a removal of the inversion cap and the flooding of Laguna Salada is likely to increase um, the rainfall in the region as the seawater would be very warm here because so you, you don't have the inversion to worry about probably. But whether this would increase this increase would be a significant increase is another question. So um, that's where we are with that. That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's always the question is we don't know until we know and we don't know until we study it and we don't know until we um, get those reports and, and that stuff initiated. And, and that's been our call to the um, state water board. Uh, we had a few different meetings with state water board representatives as they are kind of uh, overseers and purveyors of you know, policy in California. Uh, we hope that this message that you just shared and what we're gonna share quickly with Oliver is really directed at the regional water quality board that deals with the Colorado River Basin and all the way up to the federal government because this is a viable solution that needs studying. Um, so I appreciate all of this content, uh, Dr. Mitchell, and uh, appreciate your time on that. Um, I don't see any questions yet, uh, but we're a little bit short on time. We pushed it back a little bit, but I wanted to make sure that we get all the content. Um, I'm thankful that you can stay on with us today and we can kind of slide things back to make sure that we get in all the content that we need. So yeah, I'm happy to do that. So yeah, Thank I really appreciate you. it. This this again is a message uh, that this is our first step before anything else can occur. We need to have scientific validation of, of our, our all collective hypothesis. How, how does the region get affected if the Salton Sea dries or a perimeter lake is installed? That should be the first uh, environmental study that occurs for that particular proposal that the Army Corps of Engineers already received financial funding from the federal government. You need to look at what the perimeter lake concept uh, does in regard to the Colorado River Basin. So I, I really appreciate your time, uh, Dr. Mitchell, and uh, stepping in with your team. Um, hopefully we can get you started soon. Yeah, and then Oliver Branch, who's talking next, he's actually done uh, some of this lake study that you're referring to. So, yep. yeah. And, that, and that's why we have both of you here today. I, you know, for me, in any case, we, from an architecture standpoint or a developer standpoint, you often want more than one professional at the team. And we want a third, third party. We want to find a third or a fourth person to validate the information that you're having uh, and bringing forward so that when all of them are compared, all of them have that same message and they should be fairly close in their results. And that is money well spent. You know, the next year while we're doing environmental reports of the estuary and the Colorado River Delta and the Sea of Cortez, we need to do this simultaneously to, to really look at the uh, potential high scale benefit because this is really climate change mitigation and management on a, on a national scale. And it is really uh, low cost funding. If we're talking about a few hundred thousand dollars to get your, your teams uh, crunching the numbers and using the supercomputers, that is a um, drop in the bucket, we should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mitchell. We're going to turn it over to...